Good morning, Well family. To the few that are here and to all of you that are watching us online, we welcome you to this morning service. You know, for all of you that are watching us online, watching us live, uh, you still have time to share us on Facebook with your family and friends just to get God's word out, amen. Um, you know, we are praying for you guys. We know there's a lot of things that are going on in the world today, and a lot of us are being infected in, in different ways. And we're praying for you and just praying for your safety and um, that we're going to see you guys really, really soon face-to-face -face once again. As you can see, we've changed things up a little bit. We increased our worship team. <laughs> Amen. Also, if you notice the drum set over there, there's nobody behind it. So, hey, we're looking for a drummer. Right on. Um, we uh, are changing things up. We have uh, a guest speaker this morning, a man whom we all know and love dearly. Our own Pastor Darren is going to be giving us the word this morning. And so sit back, relax, and enjoy the service this morning. God bless you guys. Now let's get to our awesome worship. And let's pray. Father, we come before you, God, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, just for the work that you're doing in, in all of our hearts, God. Lord, I pray for that one um, who is watching us, God, Lord, that you would now, Lord, begin to just begin to prepare them, God, for your word. Begin to prepare them, God, for your Holy Spirit to do a work in their hearts, God. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would open our eyes to the things that you want us to see. Lord, so often we become blinded by just all the things that we are doing in life, God, that we fail to see what you, you want us to see, um, the things that are right in front of us, God. So be with us now. Uh, we offer you our worship, God. May it be a sacrifice of praise. Lord, for you are worthy, God. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we say, amen.
like I said, whether you are at home sitting in your living rooms or out for a walk, maybe walking the dog, we just want to encourage you guys to just continue to worship with us, give God glory, give God praise, amen? Amen. amen. opportunity as believers to really, Lord, show people what the love, what the true love of God, what the true love of Christ is, God. And I pray, Lord, that as we, Lord, are, are making 
Lord, a conscious effort to spend time with you. May you equip us, God, to be a light, God, in this world. Equip us, God, to be just a shoulder for someone to cry on, God. May you equip us, God, to bring comfort. So we love you. We thank you, God. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' name all God's people say, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Hello. <laughs> I wanted to let you know we miss all of you so much, but we know that you're out there and we thank you for tuning in and watching wherever you are, whether it be at home, out on vacation, or, or here with us. So thank you so much. As we kind of proceed in this environment, I just wanted to make sure, and we wanted to make sure that you're aware of all the ways you can connect with our social media. So we have a presence on Instagram and Facebook at The Well CF. And if you haven't checked out um, the Instagram for Pastor Alvin Alcantara, I suggest you go in and uh, follow him. It's very fun. So go ahead and get involved when you can in those areas. Also, just a quick heads up, we are doing communion today. So if you're joining us from home, you might want to start to get all of your different elements together so that we have those later so we can, we can do communion together. So okay, let's get on to announcements. So we know you're out there, and here are the things to know for this week. Currently, as you, as you already know, we are carrying out the in, no, no in-person services, so you are joining us from home, and we are so glad that you are with us. So thank you for tuning in. We have a stop-and-go food drive coming up. It's going to be on August 12th, and we're going to have it right here out in front of the church. We're doing this in support of families that are just struggling during this pandemic. So we're really excited to have a way to get involved and to give back. If you're interested in helping out with that, please contact Daniel or Christine, his lovely wife, and, um, and they can get you more details and get you tuned in. Also, we are coming up on our week of fasting. So during this time, it's a really, really great opportunity for us to come together and really get to the heart of things and be in prayer with the Lord. And we're going to do that through taking a fast this week. Uh, each day is going to be a different type of fast. So you want to go ahead and go onto our website, thewellcf.com, and make sure that you just check out which days have which type of fast. But please join us for that. It's a great way to connect with each other and get closer to God. We are also supporting the well ministry. So as you know, it's really important during this time that we still, we still want to be a support for our church. And that's in prayer, that's in tithing. And I just wanted to let you know the different ways that you can be tithing and, and giving back to the church right now, which is through the wellcf.com website, the Easy Tithe app, which is the one I use, very easy, and um, or texting the word GIVE to the phone number 207-606-7474. And again, you can find all that information on the website, so feel free to go back there. On to our men's and women's groups. So the men's group meets every other Saturday, and it's currently a Zoom meeting. They're going to be meeting next August 8th at 9 a.m., and uh, it's bring your own burrito. So you can enjoy from home with your own breakfast burrito. Any kind you want, get creative. And women's group. So the women's group, we've been meeting every other Thursday. We like to call it our Zoom break. It's a nice meeting where we get together, we do 10 minutes of exercise, we get into a devotional, and we have time to pray together. So we'd love to invite you to join us for that. It's a great time for us just to be able to rest in God and to connect with each other. The next one that we're going to have is on August 13th. And you can contact myself, Bree Blades, or Kathy if you have any questions. We'd love to have you join us. Community groups. So we are still doing our community groups via Zoom online. And those are Tuesdays and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We're going to continue on as usual. So 
please connect where you usually do and try another community group if you haven't, if you haven't done it yet. Please help us out there and we'd love to be able to, to have that time with you guys. That is about it for my announcements again. Just a quick reminder again, we're doing communion today, so go ahead and grab your elements and we'll celebrate that with you later. And now we're going to get back into worship. I know you're all singing very loud from home and I can feel it. We can all feel it up here. Amen. So thank you. So before we get into our next song, you know, um, I just feel led to just read this, this passage of uh, scripture to you and it's, in Psalms, it's Psalms 139, and some of you guys know this psalm, it's a popular psalm, but God has really been ministering to me through this psalm throughout the week. So it says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar, you would discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your head upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your, ha your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. And you know, this psalm really just reminds us how much God really knows you. You know, there's, sometimes we think we can run from God. Sometimes we think we can hide from God. But the truth of the matter is that God knows every single detail about us. He knows our thoughts. He knows our hearts. He knows the struggles that we have. And, and here's, a, here's a wonderful thing about that is I know my heart and I know my mind. And sometimes it could be very dark and wicked, you know. But the fact of it is that with God knowing all those things, he still loves me. He still loves me and he still chooses to pursue me and he still chooses to use me to do his work and to do his kingdom. And so even sometimes we may feel disqualified that we are not good enough or, or just worthy enough to even be used by God. Don't even... God loves you and God knows you and he has a plan for you. And so I just want to encourage you guys to draw near and draw close to him. Amen.
tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence to start this morning just by reading a few verses out of Psalms 40 for us. Psalm 40, I put all my hope in the Lord. He leaned down to me. He listened to my cry for help. He lifted me out of the pit of death, out of the mud and filth, and set my feet on solid rock. He steadied my legs. Those who put their trust in the Lord, who pay no attention to the proud or to those who follow lies, are truly happy. So now you, Lord, don't hold back any of your compassion from me. Let your loyal love and faithfulness always protect me because countless evils surround me. Let all who seek you celebrate and rejoice in you. Let those who love your salvation always say, the Lord is great. The Lord is great. Will you pray with me this morning? Dear Father, we, uh, we just want to thank you for the, for the great things you are doing Thank you for the great church family that you've given us. Thank you for the great opportunities you give us to worship you and to serve you and to be in your word. Thank you, Father, for for all of the great things you are doing. Father, we want to pray this morning for maybe that one that's out there that's feeling alone, that's feeling like nothing's working, that's feeling like they're broken. Father, I pray that you would comfort them, that you would heal them, that you would heal their bodies and their souls and their minds. And Father, speak into their heart today. 
And, and I pray that for all of us, Father, that you would fill this place with your Holy Spirit, that you would fill the, the wires and the, and the live stream and the, and the video and the audio, everything, Father. Fill it with your Holy Spirit. Rush out and meet your people, Father. Show us how faithful you are, Father. Show us how good you are and how great you are. And Father, I pray for me that you would use me for your purposes, that you would use my words to make my words your words, Father. Make my heart right for your people. Father, use me to serve your people, to show, you, show them your love for them, show them your faithfulness to them. Father, I pray for our service. I pray that you would, you would use this church for powerful things here in Signal Hill, here in Southern California, but everywhere, Father, that your word would go out and touch the lives and the eternities for millions of people, that you would fill heaven up and that we would see your kingdom at work. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in us. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. Thank you. How awesome is it to have Bree and Trinity and the trio up here with Daniel? Oh, that was awesome. Well, in, in spite of not being able to be with you physically this morning, I am still super blessed to be up here sharing God's Word with you. Uh, every, every other month or so, uh, I get to get up here and, and share God's Word with you, uh, and, and we're, go we're going through the book of Colossians together, and uh, I'm, I'm loving it. We're in part four of the series. We're calling, because of Jesus, everything is new, and I'll tell you, well, I'm ready for something new. I, I'm sure all y'all are too. The, I, I think about it, we're more than halfway through the year already. And it is, it is, time is definitely speeding up as I'm getting older. I, I know that for a fact. But, I mean, you think about all the things that have happened. It is surreal what has happened this year, right? Every single one of us is ready for something new, right? We are just done with this virus thing. We're, we are just done. We are, with all the suffering, with all the economic suffering and the physical suffering, it's, it's a mess. We're done with that. And, and we're just exhausted with the face masks and the social distancing and things not being normal. It's just, it's, it's exhausting. Every one of us wants to get back to life. Every one of us is worn out with all of this stuff. And then on top of all that, you have all of this division and, and tension in, the, in, the, in, the, in our families and in our country today. It's just, it's exhausting. It's tiring. And we have everything that we are going through, uh, we are just, we're ready for something new. We're ready for something new. So no earth shatter news here, gang, but it turns out that our world is broken, right? It, our world is broken, and I wish I could tell you that I have a solution that'll fix everything. That everything, if you do three steps, you'll get back to life and just like you love it. But I can't. That is, I can't without Jesus. Once you have Jesus, everything is new. The good news for those of us that are Christians is that in spite of all of that depressing opening monologue, in spite of all of the things that we want to be different, the Bible says that it all gets fixed when Jesus comes back. But even better news is that Jesus wants to make everything better for us Christians right now. He wants us to make, us, make all, every single one of us new right now in this service before I get to the end of this sentence. That's what he wants. Jesus wants to make it all new. He wants to make it uh, amazing for you. Jesus is supreme. He rules over everything. He created everything. And he wants you to experience that new life right now. He wants you to have the new life, the eternal life right now. And I'm, I'm, not, touching, I'm not talking about sort of a small touch up. You know, God's not super interested in, in slight improvements to your portfolio. God wants to make everything new. Jesus wants to take all of your old stuff all of the stuff that drags you down and holds you back and, and really keeps you from living the way you want to live, the, living the way that he wants you to live. He wants to take all that stuff and just chuck it and just throw it in the trash. And today we're going to talk about a super important part of our lives. So today we're going to talk about what's actually a loaded word around here. We're going to talk about religion. So the message today is because of Jesus, we have a new religion. So if you've been around any length of time, you may have heard Pastor Alvin say that he hates religion. And for somebody who, who doesn't really know Pastor Alvin well or doesn't know the, uh, what, how he, where he comes from when he says that, that can sound like a kind of a bizarro thing for a pastor to say. Because most people think of church and God and the Bible as that, as religion, right? But that's not actually the case. Religion is a man-made thing. 
Religion is, is where we invent some set of rules or some set of guidelines that, that we use to bring us up to God. But that's not the real God of the Bible. The Bible says that there's actually nothing we can do to bring ourselves up to God. And God knows that. That's why God came down to us. That's not religion. God doesn't want that. God wants a relationship with you instead. That's what God wants. And not only does God not want our religion, God actually hates religion. Because religion makes you think that you can do it on your own. Religion makes you think that you can save yourself, that you can sanctify yourself, that you can do something to make you good enough for God. The fact is, is that you can't. You can't do enough religion to get yourself close to God. You can't be spiritual enough for God to want to hang out with you. You can't give up enough bad habits. You can't do enough things. You can't be on enough pilgrimages. You can't do enough good stuff. Look what God thinks about a religion. Isaiah 64, 6, we are unfit to worship you. Each of our good deeds is a merely a filthy rag. Our best attempts to get close to God are filthy. On our own terms, we're not even fit to worship God. We are unfit to worship God. In the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul actually goes through this litany where he tells us how off the charts religious he was. And he talks about being a Pharisee and all of the things that, that he did right. And then he tells us what God's opinion of his old religion was. Philippians 3, 7 says, I once thought these things were valuable. That's natural, right? We all think that if we do good things, those are valuable. But look at the rest of it. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. That's what religion is to God. It's worthless. Religion invariably results in lists and clipboards, right? Lists of things that you have to do and clipboards of things that you can't do. All those ever produce is legalism. And all legalism actually ever produces is shame or pride. You're either ashamed that you can't make it or you're proud because you got it way better together than that guy. And even as Christians, we get into this trap. We get into this trap sometimes where we think that we can do things that make us closer to God, uh, when actually religion just drives us away from God. And that's what happened to the Colossians. They got distracted. They got their eye off the ball. They started listening to people, to what other people were telling them about God. And, and sometimes we do the same. We hear smart people or we hear people that sort of sound smart, or we hear people that have an experience that's, that resonates with us, that's sort of something like we've been through, and we start to wonder, is that true? Is, is God really like that? It, it's super easy to not look at the Bible, right? It's super easy to jump on YouTube or follow someone on social media because what they say sounds right, or because when I do this, I feel spiritual, or I feel right, well, let me tell you, gang, it, it, it's not about what sounds right. It's not about what feels right. God wants so much better for you. God wants you to know the truth. So maybe to help us relate to this a little better, I, uh, I, I want you to think back to when you were a kid. And I want you to think about like when something you thought was real as a little kid, and you come to find out later that, it, that it's not. It was just made up. So I got to be a little careful because we got kiddos listening to us. So uh, let's talk about the tooth fairy, all right? So, parents, if you, want to, if you want to avoid the spoiler, cover your kids' ears right now. But at the risk of causing emotional trauma everywhere, I want to announce that the tooth fairy is not real. I know, I know. I, I'll, I'll let you compose yourself for a minute. I, I can hear the gasps all over the internet. Um, but you remember when we used to believe in the tooth fairy, right? We used to believe that when we lost a tooth, we'd stick under the pillow and... I guess like a something like Tinkerbell or maybe, I don't know, like a second order, like second string Tinkerbell, I don't know what it was. They would sneak into our room and they would take our tooth under our pillow, which is kind of creepy when you think about it. I have no idea what they did with the teeth, but they'd take our teeth from under the pillow and they'd leave money behind. And when we were kids, we thought that was true. That was sure true. And it was amazing, right? It was amazing as a kid to think, there's this tooth fairy that comes and gets my tooth and gives me money. It's amazing. But we don't believe that anymore, right? You, and there's no super smart PhD on the internet who could convince you that the tooth fairy is real. And, and think about it. Now that we know the truth, the truth is way better anyways, right? The truth is, is that someone loved you enough that when you lost a tooth, they would 
put a little money under your, under your pillow so you could have something to look forward to. That you could, you could not feel so bad. But when we were kids, we totally believed in the tooth fairy and the whole money tooth trade thing. It made perfect sense to us when we were three. But as adults, we, we, we know it was wrong. And as adults, we do the same thing with God all the time. I mean, think about it. Too often we think of God the wrong way, right? We press God into a box that we think we can understand, that we think sounds right or seems right or feels right, instead of believing the truth, even though the truth is way better. It's way better. I'll prove it to you because we've all done this. I mean, think about it. When things are going well, what do we think? We think, oh, man, my marriage is rocking. My kids are good. I got money in the bank. The sun is shining. God loves me. This is amazing. But then how are we when things get a little uncomfortable? How are we when we lose our job or someone hurts us and gets away with it? Or someone hurts us and, or someone gets hurt or someone we love dies? How are we then? Or, I mean, think back over the past few months of this pandemic. How are we then? I thought you loved me, God. Where are you, God? Right? I mean, we've all done that, right? Honesty in church, we have all done that. Too often, you know, especially in America, life is so abundant here. We equate comfort and pleasure and happiness and success with God's approval. But that's not always true. You know, Pastor Alvin just finished a series on Jonah. It's a great series. Um, and if you remember, in, in, when Jonah wanted to disobey God, there was a super nice comfy boat just waiting for him to let him disobey God. But that boat was from, wasn't from God. The big, ugly, stinky, smelly fish was from God. The boat wasn't. I mean, listen, gang, everybody, hold up this, wherever you are, hold up the universal symbol for zero. That's how many verses are in the Bible that promise you when you are doing good, when things are going well with you, that's because God is proud of you. That's because God supports you. There are zero verses in the Bible that promise that, that draw those two together. But there are dozens and dozens of verses that say, if you follow God's will, if you do God's work, you will get persecuted. You can count on it. Why is that? That doesn't seem right. Not to our small seven pound fallen brains. But the fact is, is that God's not super interested in you being comfortable for the next five minutes. God's interested in your soul. God's working on your soul because you're going to be in eternity with him with your soul. He's building your character into something that is more like Jesus. And, I mean, you think about it, well, that means that sometimes we have to go through some tough times here. And if you think about it, it's way better that God's working on something that lasts forever than whether or not I'm comfortable but we buy into myths like that, we buy into myths like that about God all the time. If I'm comfortable, if I'm successful, that means I'm doing good by God. Or you can think of a dozen other ones, right? A loving God wouldn't send anybody to hell. I'm gonna, I believe that when I die, God's going to weigh up the good and the bad, and if the good is better than the bad, well, he'll let me into heaven. And there are, there are dozens of others. Those are all tooth fairy versions of God. And sometimes we buy into those versions instead of the way better version. Again, even as Christians, we can, we can fall into this wrong thinking all the time. We can kind of get goody two-shoesy, right? We can, we can kind of think that um, we are a better Christian than someone else because we, we, we do these other things. And I mean, maybe for the run-of-the-mill you know, run average Christian, you know, praying a little bit at, at dinner and, and reading the verse of the day, that, that's pretty good. That, that's cute. It's cute that you do that. But if you want to be a super Christian, if you want... God, to really love you. Oh, no, no, no. Well, see, there's this other list then. If you want to be one of the kids that God really loves, there's this other list. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's the clipboard of things that real Christians don't really struggle with. You know, it's the, uh, we don't smoke, we don't chew, we don't run around with girls that do. It's the seven deadly sins. It's the filthy five, the dirty dozen, whatever you got. It's the list. It's the big sins that Christians don't actually, real Christians don't actually struggle with. So when you're cured from that list, come on back, and then we can have some fellowship. And as sad as it is that we use our list and our clipboards on other people, it, it's worse sometimes. That sometimes we use them on ourselves. We were talking about this in community group just the other night, but, you know, we can convince ourselves that, you know, God, God can never love me because I don't, 
I could never have a deep relationship with God because I, right? We act like judge, jury, and executioner on other people and sometimes on ourselves too. That's all tooth fairy stuff, guys. That's, God's not like that. And he wants you to know that. Jesus wants to take all that tooth fairy stuff and chuck it. Jesus wants to make your religion new because your way is holding your back. Your way stops you from having the joy and the peace that God wants for you. Jesus wants you to know how much better the truth is, how much better a relationship with God is. Just like this, in, in this little church in Colossae, just like it does to us today, people were telling them all kinds of different things that, that weren't true, that weren't what the Bible said. Listen to the heart of uh, their pastor, Paul, and these are the, the hearts of your pastors here too. Colossians 2, 4, I am telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. You know, we don't want anyone listening to ever be deceived. We don't want ever, anyone to ever think that we are telling you something that's not in this book. The things these guys were telling them actually sounded pretty good, right? Just like it does today. But they were deceivers. Whether they, honestly, whether they knew it or not, they were deceivers. Anyone who comes along with something that, about God that isn't in his book, it's not from God. It's demonic. Uh, the Holy Spirit tells us that a few verses later, Colossians 2.8, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense. Not terribly flattering words, right? Uh, but look where they come from. That come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. There are only two options, gang. They're either from Christ and they're in this book or they're not and they're not. If it's from God, if it's not from God, if it's not in this book, then you need to shut it off. The rest of Colossians chapter 2, what we're going to get into this morning, tells us the right way, not the religious way to have a relationship with God. When, when most people think of God, they, again, they think of these rules, right? They think of the lists and the clipboards. So that's what we're going to go after this morning. Number one, Roman numeral one, if you're taking notes, lists. These are the do's, right? These are the do's. It is completely natural for people to make up lists. It is completely natural for you to think that you have to do something to be good with God. You want to be good enough. Or if God's grading on a curve, you want to be at least better than the guy behind you, Right? But Jesus wants you to be free from that. He doesn't want you to be captured by that. Jesus wants to show you the so much better way. Look at Colossians 2, 11. When you come to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. Paul actually starts here with one of the most well-known do's of history. It's this kind of weird, uncomfortable topic of circumcision. And Moses, uh, God told Moses that circumcision was required of every Jewish male. So for a Jewish family, circumcision was the way that men were identified as part of God's family. If you were circumcised, you belonged to God. If you weren't, you didn't. It really became that simple. It really became that black and white because that's what people do. That's the natural thing that people do. Circumcision became a thing that was on our list. Here's the list. If I've done everything on the list, if I got all the check marks, dun dun dun, dun I get into heaven, right? That was the list. It didn't really matter how else you lived, didn't matter how your heart was, didn't matter how your attitude was. If you could, if you could meet the list, you're good. So you could live your life with the list, and you could judge yourself by that. Even better, you could judge other people by the list. And you could compare how awesome you were to how lame they were. And Satan still uses it. Satan still uses that same mentality all the time because it's completely natural to have lists. Like I said, you have a list of what successful means, and so do I. You have a list of what beautiful means, and so do I. You have a list of what a good time is, and so do I. And people who have lists that are similar to yours are people you like to hang out with. And, and it's fine. There's, there's nothing wrong necessarily with our lists. But if we're not careful, we can do the same thing with our Christian walk. We can end up with a tooth fairy God and without even, even realizing it. We can start carrying around a list of what it means to be a real Christian. You have to pray a certain way. You have to go to the right kind of church. You have to read the right version of the Bible. You have to raise your hands the right way when you're singing. Whatever is on your list is what you think is important. And, and honestly, I believe, gang, that our lists start with good intentions. I really do. Because we want to be closer to God. 
right? We, we want to sin less often. We want to show God's love to the people around us. We want that, but we know how hard that is. We know what we've done. We know what we're capable of. Colossians 2 has it right here. Check out verses 13 and 14. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing to the cross. Look at that condemnation. On our own, we were dead because of our sins. We had a record of the charges against us, just like any criminal does. We had a record against us. And when we're being honest with ourselves, we know that's true. We know how bad we can be. And I think those are the reasons we invent our lists. We don't want to be stuck with who we used to be. We, don't, we, we want to be new. We want to be better. And we think that if we do certain things, if we act a certain way, maybe God will like us more. Maybe God will help us like, like he's paying us back for good behavior. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. My, my father's not like that. My father's not like that. You don't have to do anything to make your heavenly father love you. And the truth is, God already knows about all of your stuff. In fact, he knows more stuff about you than you haven't even figured out yet. And he loves you anyways. Listen, gang, no matter what you do, you can't make God love you more. And no matter what you do, you can't make God love you less. He loves you no matter what. For sure, God wants to make you better. God wants to make you new. That's what this series is all about. But that happens as you get closer to him. It doesn't happen by you checking off things on your list. And while most believers actually, I think, get that about our salvation, our salvation is not accomplished by anything we do, but by what, trusting what Jesus already did. We forget the same is true with our sanctification, with our Christian walk. We forget our verses back in Colossians 2, 6, and 7. Let me put them up again here real quick. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him, and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. We, I, I made this little saying. We forget that our Christian walk is powered by the Spirit of God, rooted in the Word of God, and doing the things of God. That's what our walk is about. We can't do this on our own. We need the Holy Spirit's power. We need His Word. It's all from God. That's what we need. There are no lists. Our new religion is about what Jesus already did. It's about the circumcision Christ did on you when you came to faith. It's about the relationship with God that Jesus gave you. And it's all new. It's all new. Check out the, some of the before and after photos we just read. We had a sinful nature. We have new life. We were dead because of our sins. God made us alive in Christ by forgiving us. The rap sheet from our sins was long, and we are all guilty as charged. We deserve hell for sure, every single one of us. But God took it away and nailed it to a cross. It's gone. As a Christian, you're free now. Jesus did it all. There's nothing else we have to do. But let's look at the other side of the coin now. Uh, Roman numeral two, if you're taking notes, is clipboards. These are the don'ts. The don'ts. Dun, 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 right? So just like religious people have lists of all of the thing, extra stuff you gotta do, Religious people also have a clipboard of all of the things you can't do if you want to be a real Christian. Again, not anything new. The devil doesn't do, have any new tricks because the same ones keep working. Colossians 2, verse, starting at verse 16. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they have had vision about these things. For the Colossians, someone's came along, again, convinced them of the tooth fairy God. They came along and said, yeah, Jesus is great. That's awesome. You're saved. That's great. But if you want to be a real Christian, you can't eat or drink this anymore. You have to deny yourself a bunch of stuff because that proves you're a real Christian. And the Colossians bought into it, just like we do. They bought into the empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense, just like we do. We know a, a church out by, uh, by where we live um, that uh, they have, uh, the women can't wear pants. They have to wear dresses. They can't, uh, their, their dresses have to be below the knee. They can't wear heels. They can't wear a lot of makeup. And you, that may seem silly to you. 
That may seem strange to you, but I can show you in the Bible where it says that women can't dress like men, pants. Women can't show, you know, make themselves, um, uh, draw attention to themselves, like makeup, like jewelry. I can find a verse for everything they do. So is what they're doing right or wrong? Trick question. Because it's wrong the instant that you start looking down your nose at someone and saying, you don't dress like you're supposed to. Either way. Either way, we can do that. That's wrong, because it's not God's heart. You're not a real Christian unless you don't drink or don't smoke or don't listen to secular music. Or, or let's get way more uncomfortable. You're not a real Christian if you struggle with any of the big sins. Homosexuality, adultery, drugs, alcohol, porn. You can't be a real Christian unless you are for or against, take your pick, Black Lives Matter. You can't be a real Christian unless you're for or against, again, take your pick, President Trump or the Democrats or the Republicans. Like the example of the way the women dress, I can find all kinds of verses in here to support lots of different social and political positions. Is supporting our president and Congress and all our civic leaders biblical? Absolutely. But does our president and our Congress and our civic leaders do and say stuff that's against the Bible? Absolutely. Does Black Lives Matter and the police and the protesters stand for and do things and say things that are biblical? Absolutely. But do they also say and do stuff that is against the Bible? Again, absolutely. The political parties, the groups, the factions, the cliques, family of God is not about that. Does the Bible say that homosexuality is wrong? Absolutely. But what about dropping the occasional F-bomb or flipping someone off on the road? What about living with your boyfriend or girlfriend? What about that little white lie that actually doesn't really hurt anybody? At least that's what you tell yourself. What about fudging the little numbers a little bit on my taxes or on my unemployment or on my car insurance claim? The Bible says all of those things are wrong too. Does someone who believed in Jesus and accepted Jesus any, and, and struggles with homosexuality or adultery or drugs or anything else, are they any worse or any better than a person who struggles with a lying tongue? The Bible says no. The Bible says it's all sin, and God hates all sin. Regardless of who you are, we can make a clipboard that will make you cringe and that will make you head, hang your head in shame. If you go read the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, and then you go read how Jesus... Uh, dealt with those Ten Commandments in, in Matthew uh, 5, 6, and 7, he takes them and amps them up by a bazillion. He says, your actions are not the big, biggest part of it. Your heart is what matters. Your actions aren't good enough. Not only can you not look, not only can you not have sex with someone who's not your husband or wife, but you can't even look at another person with lust in your heart. You checking out that girl that's bending over? You checking out that guy that's just walking by? Checking out some stuff on the internet? Eh, guilty of adultery. It doesn't matter. We can make a clipboard. It's super easy. It's this. It's the whole Bible. And the standard is uh, perfect. Perfect in thoughts, perfect in actions, perfect in words. Absolutely perfect, always. No one mistake, not ever. That's God's standard. That's God's clipboard. We can't even meet that for an hour, right? Not let alone a lifetime. And that's why every single one of us deserve to go to hell. But God knew that. God knew that ahead of time. He knew how impossible it would be for us to meet his standard. Guys, that's why God doesn't come at us with a clipboard. He comes at us with a cross. Let me say that again. He doesn't come at us with his clipboard. He comes at us with his cross. That's why he sent Jesus, because only Jesus can meet his clipboard. God does have some things that he says, don't do that. But that's because he loves you, and those things will hurt you. We're going to talk about that next time. But God doesn't need our help going around making sure that other people meet his clipboard, that other people meet our clipboard, even worse. God doesn't need our help making sure that people get their lives cleaned up before they come into the family of God. That's the Holy Spirit's job once you're in the family. So let's just get everyone to get in the family and then let the Holy Spirit do his work. So real quick, here's the balance. Because I don't want you to think that God is like, hey, whatever, live and let live, doesn't matter. Or who am I to judge? It's not my problem. God's not like that. It's not loving to let people drive their life off a cliff either. 
So if we see someone struggling with something, we don't just turn to blind eye and say, go ahead and do your thing, man, it sucks to be you, but I'm going to be over here. That's not loving. Look at Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. Word clipboard doesn't appear anywhere in there, even in Greek. I checked. Instead, look at what it says. It says we're supposed to gently and humbly help people. That's God's heart. God's heart is to draw sinful, broken people to him. And he's, <laughs> the crazy thing is, is that he wants us to help him do it. As broken and messed up as we are, he wants us to help him do it. God's church is a hospital, guys. It's not a police station. God's children are nurses and doctors and caregivers, not judges and wardens. God wants us to help his people. God wants us to help him help his people. As dirty and as jacked up as, and as messy as we can be, God wants you to gently and humbly help people. That's what he did when he sent Jesus, right? He sent Jesus to us when we were jacked up and messy, and he wants us to do the same. That's why that verse ends with, obey, that's how we obey the law of Christ, as we act like Jesus did. So enough with the tooth fairy version, right? Let's look at what the Bible really says uh, about, uh, about our God, about his, the relationship he wants with us. Roman numeral three, what does our Father's religion look like? Okay, I'm gonna, be, uh, I'm gonna be super transparent with you. This is not an easy message for me to listen to, let alone be up here and share with you, because me and my amazing wife, we're, we're kind of rules people, right? We're kinda, we like order, we like lists, we like things the way they should be. But it turns out, as Pastor Alvin regularly reminds us, People are messy. People are messy. They don't sort into nice, neat little bins. And if we want to represent Jesus well, we have to go to them where they are. We have to go to them in their messiness so that we can gently and humbly help them. The Tooth Fairy God have lists of do's and clipboard of don'ts on how to be a real Christian. The God of this church, the real God, has something so much better than that, guys. God doesn't want you to clean up and to get better and then come to him. God wants to help you. Just like I said at the start, Jesus wants to make you new right now and then help you wherever you are, whatever you're going through. He wants to help you through that. He wants you to become what he wants for you because he wants the best for you. Guys, there, let me just tell you, just like Daniel just said a few minutes ago, there is nothing in your life that disqualifies you from having a deep relationship with God. Nothing. There is nothing in your life that makes you a lost cause. There is nothing you did or didn't do or that it was ever done to you that God is not willing and able and, and excited to wash away with Jesus' blood. There may be some things in your life that aren't healthy for you, but those, those are things that God wants to help you with, not condemn you for. God gave up his son for you, and he'll go to the ends of the earth for you. That's what we want to be about as a church family. So let's talk about what our do's and don'ts list should look like. Real simple. I wrote three do's and three don'ts. I, I could have made a longer list. These are right from our text. I could have made longer lists, but it felt a little fake telling you not to make lists and then giving you a long list. So uh, we'll start with uh, the don'ts. Letter A, if you're taking notes, not that I'm requiring you to take your sermon notes in any special way. Um, letter A, don't get distracted by what people tell you. Don't get distracted by what people tell you. It's super important. And we've talked about already that Everything we need to know about life is in this book. It, it's right here. Everything we need to know about our life with God is right there. Nobody can improve upon it. Nobody has an extra word from God. Nobody has extra special insight. Nobody does. You know, I know most of us agree that we are super blessed to have Pastor Alvin as our, as our lead shepherd of this uh, flock. Um, I'm laughing at myself. Um, Every single one of us can think of a time when we were blessed by what Pastor Alvin said, by a message he gave, by some insights he had, uh, every single one of us. But listen, gang, the reason why Pastor Alvin has that wisdom and insight is because he's spent the last 30 years in this book. As much as I love and respect Pastor Alvin, it's not magic. And if you ask him, I, I know he will tell you the same. What he has, he got from spending time in the Word. 
He doesn't get distracted by what other people say. He doesn't get distracted by what books are on Oprah's list this month or, or what's trending or who the latest spiritual guru is. Every single person hearing me has that same access. You all have the same access to all of the wisdom, all of the insight he does. It's all in this book. So don't be distracted by what anybody else says. God wrote it all down. He wants us to know it. It's not like a puzzle that we have to figure out. Pastor Alvin says it all the time. That this book has wisdom for every part of your life. Your job, your relationships, your diet, everything is in this book. It's amazing. Yes, of course, get help from good Bible resources. Get help from people you trust in your church family. Get help from community groups. But don't get distracted by other ideas you hear from other people. If it's, if it's not in here, it's just not worth much of your time, guys. Secondly, don't focus too much on rules. Don't focus too much on rules. We talked about list and clipboards. I don't want you to leave, to leave thinking that any of God's rules are bad. They're not. God's rules are good, That's, and he wrote them down for us to protect us. That's the reason. They're pro- to, there to protect us. They're like guardrails on a road, and they're to, to, to keep us from hurting ourselves and keep us from hurting other people because sin is damaging. It's destructive, and the carnage left over from sin is vast, and he doesn't want that for you. So, so don't ignore the rules. Don't make extra rules for sure. Uh, just don't focus so much on the rules that you miss the reason that the rules are there. In our text this morning, really, all over the Bible, we see that God says, don't follow rules just for the sake of following rules. And in Romans 14, chapter 14, for example, it's the whole chapter is about love rules over rules. It turns out there is, there is no magic checklist, there's no special recipe for every situation in your life. We have to actually think. We have to think about how, what the Bible says applies to every situation we're in. We have to pray always about how God wants us to react in that situation. We have to think about how our life is affecting other people, about how what we say and what we do is affecting other people. You have to pay attention to that. And if something you you do is going to hurt someone else, don't do it, even if you can, even if it's not a sin. Don't do it if it's going to hurt someone else. Likewise, if there's something you can do that will help someone, do it. Rules are not the thing, guys. Helping your brothers and sisters with their relationship in Christ, with Christ, that's the thing. So don't focus too much on the rules. All right, third don't. Don't be intimidated by sin. This is, this is so good. Don't ever feel like you're powerless against temptation. As a Christian, you don't ever have to feel like that. You never have to sin. Don't let the enemy of your soul tell you that you have to, whatever it is, fill in the blank. That you don't have a choice, that that is who you are. That's a lie. Because of Jesus, you are free from that. We are all free from that. This is the new life we have. Because of Jesus, we are no longer defined by what we do. Because of Jesus, we are defined by who we belong to. We read all this in our text this morning. So real quick, as a Christian, let me just run through this list. Our sinful nature is cut away. It's gone. We are alive with Christ now. We're not dead anymore. God disarmed and shamed the devil. You don't have to be afraid of him anymore. He has no power over you. We died with Christ. We are free from our enemies. You don't have to be the way you were. And don't let the enemy try and remind you of the past either. All of the shame, all of the guilt, Jesus took care of all of that. If you're a Christian, Jesus took your rap sheet and he nailed it to the cross, it's gone. Bible calls the devil the accuser because he likes to bring our stuff up to try and bring us down. He wants us to apply those lists and clipboards to us so that we feel so self-condemned that we're not useful to God, that we don't believe that we could ever be useful to God. But listen, gang, Jesus set you free from all that. He set you free from who you used to be. So don't let the accuser bring that stuff up. How's the saying go? The next time the devil reminds you of your past, just remind him of his future, right? You are not a slave to sin anymore. 
You don't have to be intimidated by, by sin anymore. If you are a Christian, you have a new life now. You are free to choose what honors Jesus. You are free to choose to love someone else other than yourself. You are free to choose how to be generous with your time and your talent and your treasure, how you can serve God with everything that you are. You are free to do that. So those are the three don'ts, all right? Now here are three do's, super quick. Uh, First one, letter A, do remind yourself that you can only be complete in Christ. You can only be complete in Christ. I like simple stuff, guys, And, and the Bible is full of simple stuff. I said simple, not easy, just for the record. There's a bunch of simple stuff in the Bible. Here's an example of one. If you're looking for how your life can be fulfilled, this is it. We have the answer right here, Colossians 2.10. So you also are complete through your union with Christ. That is the only way that you can truly be complete. That is the only way that you can truly ever feel fulfilled is in a deepening relationship with Christ. It's a simple thing, again, but it's not an easy thing because it's easy to forget that. We are constantly bombarded with stuff. We have to constantly remind ourselves of that. That's why this verse actually comes right after the um, uh, empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense verse because God knows that we're going to get hit with stuff all the time. People are so quick to invent and embrace two fairy stuff, but they think that that will make them complete, and it's not true. Nothing else will ever ever satisfy you like Jesus will. Whether you're chasing the next dollar or the next accomplishment or finding the right man or the right woman, nothing will do it like a deepening relationship with Christ. Our enemy always wants us to think we need more, that we need to find some other secret, some other thing, but that's a lie. Jesus wants to be the king of your whole life because he wants to make your whole life new and better. You are only complete in Christ. You don't need any of that other stuff. Keep reminding yourself of that truth. Second do, do put your faith on display. Colossians 2.12 talks about baptism. You were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. We practice what's known as believer's baptism and, uh, because we, we believe the Bible is, the biblical evidence for that is, is overwhelming, seriously. Baptism is an outward sign of the faith you already have. Baptism doesn't save you, but baptism is what saved people do. Baptism is a proclamation to the world that you are standing with Jesus, that you are flying the Jesus flag at the top of the pole, that you're not ashamed or afraid of your relationship and your faith in Jesus. You want everyone to know I'm with Jesus. And just like baptism, everything we do should shout that truth. Our faith should be on display all the time, 24-7. Not arrogantly, of course, but authentic, gentle, attractive. It should be obvious to everyone that we have a new life, right? It's not running around thumping your Bible everywhere you go. It's not just wearing the he is greater than I hat or having the Christian sticker on your car. All those things are fine, but this is... This is different. This is in, inside. This is not just an outward show. Our life needs to be different than unbelievers. The things you do should put Jesus on display. The things you sh- say should put Jesus on display. And maybe the most important is the way that you do that should put Jesus on display. We want people to see us and how we do life and think, what, what is it that they have? Why is it so different? I want that. That's the, the Bible actually tells us that will happen. When we live like Jesus would live, when our faith is obvious to anyone, look at what 1 Peter 3.15 says. This is from the message paraphrase. I really like this. Through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention in adoration before Christ your master. Be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks why you're living the way you are and always with the utmost courtesy. When we live like that, when we live with Jesus on display, People, will, people can't help but notice. They will be attracted to us. They'll be attracted to that lifestyle. And that gives you the perfect opportunity to, to introduce them to the real Jesus. Not the tooth fairy one, but the real one. And to invite them to have that new life with you. All right, final do. Do stay connected with Christ. Do stay connected with Christ. In Colossians 2, uh, 18 and 19 is actually a condemnation against people who we've been talking about, who try to enforce their lists and clipboards on people. Look at what it says. Their sinful minds have made them proud, and they are not connected to Christ 
the head of the body. That's a scary verse. That should scare anyone who thinks that it's their job to enforce their rules. The Bible says you're not even a part of the family when you do that. So let's turn around and look at how we should be. Let's add the word stay to the beginning of verse 19. Uh, so here's the Darren Mer- Mirror version of uh, Colossians 2.19. I, I'm going to say it's better than the other DMV. Um, Colossians 2.19, stay connected to Christ, the head of the body, for he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. We have to stay connected to Christ, guys. We have to. That's how we grow. That's how we see other people grow. That's how we see God's kingdom grow. It says right there, God's the one that makes it grow. It's not us. Jesus tells us the same thing, actually, in John 15. You guys remember, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If we want to be fruitful, if we want to bring glory to God, we have to stay connected to him. He's the vine, we're just regular old branches. We got to stay connected to him. We are powerless without Jesus, but oh, when we are connected to Jesus, when, we, when he is our power source, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength, right? We can do all things. But we need to do that. We need to stay connected, and that requires an intentional, regular, frequent, I almost said daily, but it's daily isn't enough, frequent decision to do it, to stay connected to Christ. Because I don't know where it is with you life, where you do life, but with me, it's not all rainbows and unicorns everywhere, right? Especially right now. It's easy to get off in a ditch somewhere with the wheels up. It's easy to focus on what's wrong with the world or with our families or with our country. It's easy to forget this pandemic ain't going to go forever. It's easy to forget that this is not our home. And we can spend all of our time and energy trying to get comfortable here when it's not our home. But to escape all that, we need to stay connected with Christ. Hebrews 12, too, so good. We must keep our eyes on Jesus who leads us and makes our faith complete. So how do we do that? Great question. Back to our definition of what the Christian walk is. Powered by the Spirit of God, rooted in the Word of God, doing the things of God. Let me just take a look at those real super quick. Powered by the Spirit of God. Start your day by asking God to help you today, to send you His Holy Spirit today. Ask Him to empower your life today. And then keep a continual, ongoing conversation with your Father all day long. In every situation, in every conversation, ask him to give you wisdom on what words to use. Ask him in every circumstances to give you patience and to give you insight and to make your actions like Jesus. You're going to need it, and he will gladly give it to you. Number two, rooted in the word of God. Be in this book every day, every single day, multiple times a day. This book will tell you the truth every single time. Make it a habit to know what this book says. Do everything you can to keep it in the front of your mind. And then finally, doing the things of God. Commit your life to just doing what this book says. Honestly, whether you like what it says or not, because God promises a good result when you do it. Commit your life to serving God and his people regularly. Pick up the phone and call someone you haven't seen or heard from in a while, especially now where who knows what people are going through. When we're able to open back up, as easy as it is to catch service from home, come on in. Come on in and join us. We need to see you as much as you need to see us. Hang out with people and do life with people who are in your church family. If you're not in a community group, join one. It is literally super easy. Now that we can Zoom everything, it is a piece of cake to be a part of a, a community group. So do that, guys. Do those three things. Powered by the Spirit of God, rooted in the Word of God, doing the things of God most important do is to stay connected with Christ. So let me wrap up here, gang. You know, Jesus wants to flush the tooth fairy version of God for us, right? He doesn't want us to have that anymore. He doesn't want to mess with that anymore. Jesus wants to replace the rules and the lists and the clipboards and the shame and the pride and the guilt. He wants to replace all that with an amazing relationship with the God of the universe. Jesus wants to give you freedom. He wants to give you light that you can only find in him. He wants that. Jesus wants to help you grow as part of his family, as part of the family here. Our life with God is is not made better by following a set of rules. Our life with God is made made better just like any relationship is made better. Spend time with him. Spend time with your father. Listen to what he says and do that. Spend time with people who love your father the same way you do. 
God doesn't want you to follow a checklist, guys. He wants you to follow Jesus. Let's all bow our heads. I'm going to share a, another verse for you while you got your head bowed. Galatians 2.19, such a good verse. What actually took place is this. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a lawman so that I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. God wants that relationship with each and every one of you, with each and every one of us. He doesn't want you to waste your time on anything but the real thing. If you're not a Christian, you're missing out. If you have never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, you are stuck with a tooth fairy version of God. And after you die, your eternity is going to be awful. And and God doesn't want that for you, and neither do we. Right now is a perfect time to fix that. It's a perfect time to fix that. God's clipboard, God's standard, like we said, is perfect. And you can't meet it, and neither can I. God sent Jesus to meet it for you. Tell Jesus that you need to know him. Ask him to save you. Ask him to be the new master of your life, and he will. And he will bring you to heaven with him when you die. If you are a Christian, let me, let me just ask you, what is it that you need to stop obsessing about? What is it that's getting in the way of your deeper relationship with God? What is it that holds your attention? Is it rules? Is it comfort? Is it shame? Is it pride? Bring that to God right now as we pray. He wants to get rid of that for you. He he doesn't want you to be shackled with that anymore. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. Dear Father, I I just want to thank you for, for your truth today. I want to thank you for the lives and the eternities that you are changing, Father. For anyone who doesn't know you, Jesus, I, I, I want you to ask you to grab their hearts. Don't let them rest until they find you, until they find that eternal rest in you. Father, I, I want to just pray for those who are struggling today. I want to pray for those who want to know you better, but don't know how or feel like they can't or feel like they have done too much wrong to get close to you. Father, flood them with your Holy Spirit. Comfort them, Father, with the knowledge that uh, that you love them, and that you want to draw near to them and you want to change them, you want to grow them, and you want a relationship with you. Father, we, we lift up this church, we lift up this country, we lift up our families and every single one of our people. Bless them, Father. Make us united, make us the the family you want us to be. Make us into the people, the men and the women that you want us to be. Make our families great and close and tight. Fill us with love, Father. Fill us with the love of Jesus so that people see us and want some of that. They want some of that. Thank you, Father, for your word. And I pray for every single person hearing my voice that you would bless them and, and, and just remind them how much you love them, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Love you. And uh, again, please join us in our fast next week. We are really praying that God pulls us close and, and, and unifies us. Uh, we, uh, we can't wait to see y'all. Can't wait to open up and, and see everybody and see how they've been. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Alvin to come up. We're going to do communion. Then he's going to close the service for you. Thank you. Love you, guys. Good morning. What a fantastic, superb message. It was so Christ-centered. Man, it was an awesome, awesome message. Well, we're going to prepare for communion, and so Daniel's going to lead us in worship, and uh, we're going to get ready as we gather our elements together. Amen. Gracious to you, the Lord.
on him and looked the other way he was despised and we did not care yet it it was our weaknesses he carried it was our sorrows that weighed him down and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God a punishment for his own sins but he was pierced for our rebellion crushed for our sins he was beaten so we could be whole he was whipped so we could be healed all of us like sheep have strayed away We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet never said a word. He was like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before its shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was laid away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short, in in midstream and because of his experience my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous for he will bear all their sins you know as we prepare to partake of communion communion always reminds me of three things it's a time of remembrance where we take time to remember the life and the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the immeasurable sacrifice that Jesus made for you and I that we could stand here not in our own righteousness but in the righteousness that God has imputed to us by faith 
And that's, that's such an amazing thing because no one would be here apart from the love of God. The Bible tells us in Romans 5 8 that while we were yet sinners, that Christ demonstrated his love for us by coming to die for us. What an incredible thing that is. That Christ died and he bore on himself our sins. And so today we take time to remember that. We, we, it's a time for us to remember the cross where we come back to the foot of the cross and we are grounded once again recognizing again the immeasurable price that Jesus paid for us. But it's also a time for reflection where we take the time to consider our walk with God, possibly how far we have strayed from God, possibly the things that we've done to offend God, to that have grieved His Spirit. It's a time for us to reflect upon our walks with God. But it is also a time not just of remembrance, not just of reflection, but it's a time of renewal. It's at the table of communion that Christ wants to meet with you. He wants to nourish your soul and your spirit through his body and through his blood and renew your faith. And so this morning as we prepare to participate in communion, that's what God wants to do. He wants to bring us to the foot of the cross that we might remember his ultimate sacrifice. He wants to bring us to that place of reflection where we consider where we are with God. And he wants to bring us to that place of absolute renewal where we are refreshed and we leave this place different people that is God's heart for every single one of us that we would never come to church uh, one way and then leave the same way but that we would leave different people that he would transform us by his spirit by his word by his body by his blood and so as we prepare to partake of communion would you bow your heads with me as we take a moment to pray and the Bible says, you know, this is a time for you to reflect and confess sins and make things right with God before you partake. And so bow your heads as we just have a moment of silence. I will lead you in prayer. Father, we bow our hearts before you today. And as we gaze upon the cross, we are humbled by the magnitude of your sacrifice, by the enormity of of your love for us. God, we thank you, Lord, that you would die for sinful men and women like us who fall short in every way imaginable, in our conduct, in our character, in our conversation. Lord, we fall short. We are deficient in so many ways, but we thank you that it is, that is, it is in Christ that we are made whole, that it is in Christ we are made new, that it is in Christ that we are washed and made as white as snow. We thank you, Lord, that you bore our sins, that your iniquities were laid upon your son, Lord, and we are so grateful, Jesus, that you took our sins upon yourself. And so today, Lord, I pray Lord, that not one of us would come to the table of communion flippantly, irreverently, but with a heart of absolute gratitude and humility and a heart of worship. And so, Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so let's partake together. After supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Once again, he tells us, Do this to remember me as often as you drink it, 
For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's drink together. Father, once again, we lift our hearts and we lift our voices in praise and in thanksgiving to you. We thank you, Lord, because of your son, Jesus. Lord, you've given us an open invitation into your kingdom. We have the hope of eternity and eternal life, the hope of heaven, Lord, that one day, Lord, we will be ushered into your presence. And we thank you so much, Lord, that you love us that much. And so, Lord, I pray, fill us with a heart of praise and thanksgiving as we worship you. I'm going to have Daniel lead us in a song, and, and let's worship God. I really want you guys to sing with all your hearts. And those of you who are streaming with us, I want you to sing with us as well. You may be in your living room, you may be in your car, wherever. Take this time to worship with us. Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come. to come and the cross before me my hope on things above and in you Jesus the best is yet to come your presence is an open door centrality of Christ it's all about Jesus and it can that's that's what it's always and always will be about about Jesus 
You know, the Bible says, fixing our eyes upon the author and finisher of our faith. And that's why that message was so powerful. I hope you guys took good notes because, man, it is about Jesus. That's where breakthrough is. That's where revival is. That's where salvation is. That's where healing is in the name of Jesus. I want to tell you guys how much we love our well family. We want to thank those of you who are live streaming with us and tell you, man, we are excited for you. We are praying for you. We are believing God for great things. And we are so incredibly grateful that you allow us to be a part of your lives, that you allow us in your homes and in your hearts. If there's any way that we can be a blessing to you, any way that we can pray for you, please write us. Please let us know. If you need a Bible, we want to send you one. We want you to know that that we consider you a, a part of our family. Those of you who are live streaming with us uh, outside of the state, outside of the country, we are praying for you. We're believing in the advancement of the gospel. With technology today, I want you guys to think about this. With technology, we are actually, we have a global audience. It's not just local here, but we have a global audience. And so, you know, we are praying for you all as we continue to ask that you would pray for us as we seek to advance the kingdom and declare the good news of Jesus Christ in this dark time. Also, we want to continue to ask that you would, you know, continue to support us financially. If you're not, would you prayerfully do that? Because you know what? It takes finances to carry out the work of God here. And so if you can get behind us in what we're doing, we are so grateful to be able to minister to you and continue to do what we believe God has called us to do. And so God bless you guys. I hope you had a great time in service, whether you were present or at uh, abroad somewhere. We love you in the Lord. Amen. God bless you.